Hello, welcome to today's webinar um, hosted by ERI's San Diego Regional Chapter. This is the first in the 2023 Kenji Ishihara Colloquium series on advancing earthquake engineering in the wake of the Turkey-Syria earthquakes. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm ERI's Communications and Program Manager. Before we hand it over to the chapter today, I just want to take a brief moment to introduce ERI for those of you who aren't familiar with the organization. We're the leading nonprofit membership organization working to bring together professionals from across a wide range of disciplines, both in the US and around the world, who are working to understand earthquake risk and advance earthquake resilience. Uh, we offer a lot of great benefits to members, um, including things like this webinar series, but also our journal Earthquake Spectra, opportunities to network, um, take part in events, get training. So if you wanna find out more and join, you can uh, follow the link here to our website. And I want to briefly just uh, give everyone a heads up about our 2024 annual meeting, which will be in Seattle next spring. Uh, that QR code should take you to the website. Uh, registration is now open, and uh, particularly that we have a call for special session proposals and poster abstracts that are due October 17th. So if you're planning to submit something for the meeting, uh, um, I hope you're getting to work on that soon, and we're looking forward to seeing you all there. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Chang from the San Diego Regional Chapter, who's uh, going to introduce our speakers and event today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're happy to have the you all participate in um, the San Diego Regional Chapter's event today. Um, this is the first of our three um, seminars that we're doing on the Ishihara Colloquium this year to discuss the implications from the Turkey earthquake and what are we doing to look forward and how is this going to impact engineering practice. So today's session will entirely be about ground motions. Um, we've got four great speakers lined up and we'll go through their various presentations. Um, we will have a short break after the first two speakers for an opportunity for some questions. And then again, um, a short break, a five minute break. And then we'll resume with the presentations and then have a final question and answer and a little bit of panel discussion for everyone. Um, please use the Q&A tab instead of the chat if you're gonna enter questions at the bottom. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom in the Zoom, you'll see that it's right next to the chat. There is the Q&A button. Please submit questions through that panel. Our first speaker today is uh, Tristan Buckreese, and he's a postdoctoral scholar at UCLA. His research interests and focus are on um, geotechnical earthquake engineering with an emphasis in ground motion characterization and looking at regional path effects, local site response. He is currently also working on development of the NJA West 3 project. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tristan. Good morning, and thank you, Kristen, for the introduction. So the main focus of my presentation today, the hero, if you want, so to speak, are the ground motions themselves and how they're going to be impacting, um, how they're going to impact our future as engineers and researchers and seismologists. And so I will be touching on some analysis that we've done and other technical details, but the main uh, message that I want to get across is, is how useful these ground motions will be or prove to be. And so first, I'd like to begin by just uh, a couple of acknowledgments. The work that we went in, that we performed in curating the data set and also some of the analyses that I'll be highlighting today have been assisted by some researchers in the U.S. So their names are shown on the and affiliations are shown on the right hand side. And then we also have a number of Turkish colleagues at various institutions that have helped uh, in issues related to, to the ground motion data for processing access. Um, uh, any errors in the data from initial releases and, and such like that, and also some uh, some conversation just on, on how to interpret the ground motions that's also uh, benefited uh, through these uh, individuals listed on the screen. So the outline of today's presentation, and sorry, let me just set uh, the timer for myself. As it's, it's a pretty basic uh, outline. I want to begin by first going over uh, an overview of the ground motion data itself. That way we're all familiar with, with what we have available. And then the body of the presentation will be impacts related to certain themes. So the first theme is impacts towards ground motion modeling. The second are near field effects. And then the last and probably the, the most impactful might be spatial analyses results. Um, if in regard to a pure ground motion sense. And then I'll close it off with some summary and conclusion remarks. So beginning first with an overview of the ground motion data. 
So the earthquake sequence uh, started off with a bang, so to speak, with a magnitude 7.8 uh, event, February 2nd, early morning hours. It was a, a pretty large uh, active crustal or shallow crustal earthquake. It was followed about 10 minutes later by another notable event, a magnitude 6.8, uh, located really close to the epicenter also. And then there were many notable aftershocks all, af, uh, between uh, that have occurred uh, after that 6.8. And I want to just mention that when I say notable aftershock, I just mean greater than a magnitude 4. So these are motions that are definitely felt by, by people. And about nine hours after the initial magnitude 7.8, we had the, that second large aftershock, which was a magnitude 7.7 .7 north of the, the initial rupture. This was also a major event that produced strong shaking. And this was also followed by many more aftershocks. And then the fourth and last major notable event that I'll be discussing is magnitude 6.3 that happened in the southern end of the initial rupture about four, two weeks after the magnitude 7.8. But these were also followed by many other aftershocks. And so I wanna just highlight that many ground motions have been produced from this uh, earthquake sequence. However, as far as our interest over here in the United States, particularly uh, for the work that I've been, been a part of, we've mainly been focused on these four major earthquakes. Whereas I know a lot of other efforts have been uh, have been done in curating and analyzing the, the various aftershocks that are shown here. But throughout this presentation, I'm just going to be focusing on the earthquakes that are the ground motions that were produced from these four uh, significant events in this earthquake sequence. As far as the ground motion data itself, unprocessed data was provided by the Disaster and Emergency Management Authority, or AFAD, in Turkey. And there are two major uh, seismic networks that produce the ground motion records. Um, they span pretty much uh, a, a very good assortment uh, across Turkey itself. We also scooped up data through the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, or IRIS's web services. Um, this was a, uh, there were a couple other um, regional seismic networks operating in the area, uh, with stations operating in the area, rather, that uh, produced ground motions, and so those are listed here as well. As far as a map of the area, we can see the four events and the rupture surfaces for the two major um, uh, earthquakes shown uh, in the inset map in the lower right. And the triangle symbols represent locations where we have usable ground motion records. And I have whether or not we have a measured or a proxy based VS30 also, but that's not um, too critical for today's uh, conversation. As I mentioned before, most of our observations are in Turkey itself. So kind of to the north uh, half of, of the faults, if you may, there are some recordings to the south, and we are aware that there are recordings down in Syria and Lebanon, but those still have not been made available to date. So we're kind of in limbo waiting for those. But uh, as far as now, we have a um, good amount of ground motion data across Turkey and also over in Cyprus as well. As far as looking at the distribution, the distribution of the data, we have between about 220 to 350 or so recordings for each of these events. Um, that are usable over a wide period range. They do fall off at long periods due to the filtering and the longest usable filter, uh, longest usable period that's a function of the corner frequency used during signal processing. And especially for the magnitude 7.8, it's well recorded over um, a wide distance range, both near source moderate um, distances and at far distances. And I'll touch on that in later parts of the presentation. And with that, I don't have too much more to say about the data itself. I do want to just point out that all of the ground motion data that we've assembled and we've looked at, uh, we've published as a data set on DesignSafe. And so the DOI for this uh, release is shown at the top of the screen. And this includes the processed acceleration time series, as well as uh, flat files that contain all of the metadata. So these are your, your distances, your source metadata, your site conditions, things like that, as well as the intensity measures, which include response, spectral, uh, response spectra, effective amplitude spectra, cumulative absolute velocity, and RES intensity measures. So with that, I'd like to, to go into discussing some of the future impacts. And first, I'm going to begin with impacts related to ground motion modeling, which is a pretty broad topic in and of itself. So the first thing when it comes to ground motion modeling is, is we like to use data to develop these models. And in the US, a uh, popular database is the Next Generation Attenuation, or NGA West 2 database. And so the da that database is represented in these plots here by the blue symbols, so the blue, blue crosses and the blue um, bars in the histograms. 
it, in case you're not aware, NGA West 3 kicked off earlier this year, and it's in the, the data uh, curation stage. So we're building up the database for NGA West 3. And the events uh, produced from this earthquake sequence are going to be included as part of this uh, updated NGA West database. And so that's why I just want to highlight how these four significant events will impact the, the data base itself. Now, one thing to note when it comes to tying into ground motion models is that all ground motions are not created equal. Um, this is going to be kind of clear in, in a minute when I explain why we have to screen them. But when you develop a ground motion model, you can't just use all of the data. We have to, to screen out certain things to ensure that our data aren't biased and that they represent um, kind of the whole distribution of expected ground motions. So the first thing is we only like to use events that are well recorded so, so that we can properly account for so, whether things are source effects, path effects, or side effects. Uh, engineers commonly are most interested in PSA, or at least presently. And so we only use magnitudes greater than 4.0 because the smaller magnitude response spectral shapes don't scale well with, with what we expect. So we, we use these larger data. And lastly, we only use data within a usable distance range so that if you're at a very far distance, you're not being biased by, uh, by any strong uh, records because we're not recording any of the, the weak records. So with this, we could see that, that this database has essentially shrunk quite a bit from its complete uh, entirety. However, the big thing I want to point out is that the events from this earthquake sequence make up a considerable portion of the large magnitude data. And so with that, this could have large... Uh, implications because at, at the end of the day, in many hazard scenarios, it's these large magnitudes that control the hazard. And so by adding to the empirical data set, we can better constrain ground motion models as we'll see in the following slides. So if we want to look at the data, and so each column is for a different earthquake. I have the largest earthquake on the to the left and the smallest earthquake to the right. The top row is for PGA, the middle row is PGV, and the bottom row is PSA at uh, one second. And everything's plotted against distance, and the colored symbols are just different site conditions. So we see typical trends that we would expect for all these ground motions, where the uh, if I just focus to the top uh, left for illustration purposes, near the source, we have the highest amplitudes that will decrease or bend down as we get further away from the, from the earthquake. If we compare this to existing models, so we have a global ground motion model. This is an NGA West 2 model. Our representative model throughout this presentation will be uh, the Bore et al. 2014 or BSSA 14 model, shown by the solid, the dash dot, and the dotted lines for the different regionalization terms for the path effects. And then a locally calibrated ground motion model, Calais et al. 2015 or KAAH 15, that's made uh, uh, specifically for the Turkish region. We can see that they perform. Okay, for the most part. However, there is some misfit that's pretty strong. So, for example, in PGV, the KAAH model significantly underpredicts. There's some issues in almost all of the models at far distances. And instead of spending time looking at these plots, we can look at things a little clearer if we look at residuals. So, a residual by definition is just the log difference of an observation minus the prediction of a ground motion model. And so with these plots, it's the same format as before, with each column being an earthquake, each row being a, a specific intensity measure, and everything's plotted against distance. The red is for the KAH Turkish model. The BSSA 14 is shown uh, in blue, which is the global model. And I won't spend too much time dwelling on these observations. I just want to point out a couple features that are consistent across all of these uh, intensity measures, and that's we have regions or distance ranges that are relatively flat, which suggests that the ground motion models do an okay job of predicting the trend with respect to distance. Now, there may be an offset or a shift vertically that suggests event bias, which I'll touch on in the next slide, but the trends with distance or the path effects are pretty well captured. Then when we get at much farther distances, we see that the observations in the region are not agreeing well with what the ground motion models are predicting because we see these trends in slope. Downward slope meaning faster attenuation is, is actually occurring, upward slope is slower attenuation. So that means that the ground motion models aren't doing well at, far, at large distances. So keeping this in mind, we'll go through this slide and this will also come back up when we touch about, uh, when I touch on the spatial analysis results later on. So I said 
that we can talk about event terms. And that's, if I come back here, where the model does reasonably well with respect to distance, but there's some offset vertically. An event term just quantifies that bias. It's the average of where the total residuals are stable. So we can see these are plots of the event terms for each of the events versus uh, period for the lines or each dot is PGA and PGP. And if it's a plotted above zero, that means that the models are under predicting. If it's plotted below zero, that means that the models are over predicting. And for the most part, we see that there's some trends, but I just want to highlight thing, these by adding in a little animation where this is magnitude scaling for the BSSA 14 model, and each dot represents an earthquake plotted on magnitude, and this is the, the, the scaling. We can see that the scaling for the most part is uh, doing an okay job. It matches where the where the points are, but if you were to eyeball a, a slope between these four points at certain uh, periods, it doesn't match what the model is predicting. And so that would suggest that we might need to update uh, the VS30 scaling going forward for future ground, or not VS30 scaling, sorry, magnitude scaling for future ground motion models moving forward. And that will have surely have impacts um, on hazard levels that are predicted using these ground motion models. As far as the, the impacts and the implications, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this section, the data from four events uh, add significantly to parametric ranges where we don't have a lot of empirical data. This is specifically true for large magnitude and short distances, uh, which will help with magnitude scaling globally and locally, and also improve distance attenuation and side effects locally. One thing that I didn't touch on too much is that there are also a lot of ground motions that have large amplitudes. So this is a histogram of PGA uh, versus number of records, number of records and log scale on the top. And we can see that some of the largest PGAs in the entire database uh, that would uh, is going to be in GOS3 will come from this earthquake sequence. So these are going to be great because we can investigate uh, side effect, nonlinear side effects empirically, but also these are motions that are of special interest to structural engineers and other engineers for use in time history analyses. So with that, I'm going to move to the next uh, subsection, which is near field effects. And this section is more of a kind of broad overview as opposed to getting into nitty gritty. So there's kind of a consensus that near field is considered anything within 25 kilometers of the fault. And so for this section, we're going to be focusing mainly on the magnitude 7.8 main shock because that's where we have the most near field records. And I have it summarized here how many records uh, for each bin of distance. So we have 10 records within two and a half kilometers of the fault, five within two and a half to five, 10 within five to 10, and 13 within 10 to 25, meaning we have roughly 40 records within 25 kilometers of the fault, which is a, a quite a considerable data set, and we see them again plotted here. For the following slides, we will mainly be focusing on the southern end of the fault because that's where the ground motion data is, and so that's where we can uh, learn from these near fault records. So the, any maps shown in the following slides are just going to be in this uh, uh, region that's outlined here. So the first near fault effect that I want to, to talk about briefly is directivity. So directivity is related to the fact that as the earthquake ruptures, it's not just a point source, it's going to rupture over some distributed fault system. And because of that, we have energy being generated at different points, and therefore it'll reach our site at different times. And there's also the effect of whether or not the rupture is approaching our site or moving away and things like that. And that's essentially directivity in a nutshell. We know that this or the main shock ruptured initially on the small segment, and then it uh, branched off to the north and to the south, uh, where it intersected the east end of Anatolian fault. And so in the southern uh, end of the fault where we're interested in for this uh, section of the presentation, the rupture was moving in the southerly direction. And from this, we can expect some forward directivity effects. And what we'd expect from this is, is what we see in the ground motions are pulse-like features um, that are of special interest to design structures. Uh, they're parameterized by being a pulse period and a pulse amplitude. But essentially, they're pulses of energy seen in the velocity time series where the rupture or the, the energy that is produced by early segments that rupture. So for example, up here, will reach our site the same time that this segment is rupturing. So it's an accumulation of, of energy at our site which manifests as these pulse features with large amplitudes. Now, a lot can be said about these. They're very interesting. I think uh, a lot can be done with them. We haven't worked too much about them, so I just wanted to mention that this is one field that um, 
that has certain potential. What we have touched on that is related to these pulse effects are fling effects. And so are sometimes called static displacements. And I have an animation because this might not be familiar to, to everyone as, as directivity is. So with an earthquake, we know that there's going to be some, some displacement, some offset, because the rupture is a fault slipping uh, at the end of the day. So if we consider a couple pseudo stations located near the fault, where the black stations are really close to the fault, purple are a uh, little bit further away, and then the green are a little bit, are, are much further away. What we can expect in the displacement time series from these records, and this is going to be the fault parallel component so that we could maximize seeing uh, these effects, because we expect this side of the plate to move upward, the side of the plate, to, uh, or the side of the fault to move downward, is in the, the displacement time domain, where those velocity pulses are, we'd see a big step essentially in the displacement time series in the direction of 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 uh, of wh wh whichever it's moving based off of this sign convention that i've defined here with the records closest to the fault having the largest permanent displacements the records as we get further away this displacement goes uh, away essentially this is important because if you have distributed infrastructure such as a pipeline or electrical lines or other things like that or a large project or even if you're close to the fault, these permanent displacements can wreak havoc and, and can cause significant destruction uh, on your, your, your system. And so we'd like to, to as, as part of uh, uh, accounting for these effects in, in future design and mitigation of, of any, uh, any of the, the damages and whatnot afterward, after the event, we want to try to, to be able to extract this information from the empirical data because sometimes we don't have this information from, uh, uh, or sometimes the, the reconnaissance missions don't provide too much information on uh, rupture displacements far away from the fault, whereas we can extract some of this information from the ground motions themselves. So that's what fling extraction procedures do. Now, there are many different methods that branch into two kind of general approaches. The first are simple baseline correction methods. I've just listed two common ones here. And the second are pulse fitting methods um, that uh, you might be more familiar with because these are methods that are commonly used to get directivity parameters or the, the pulse period and the pulse amplitude and things like that. Now, the issue with both of these is that they're sensitive to how you select parameters and run your procedure. So where, the, where you select your start and stopping times, what functional forms you use, stuff like that, can impact the magnitude of the fling that you extract from the displacement time series. And so one question that we've been playing around with is can we quantify this uncertainty in the fling? And not getting into details, but what we've done is we've applied simple baseline procedures and we've uh, perturbed various uh, parameters, and we've run through many different um, uh, procedures. And these are results for two different sites, one located about four kilometers from the earthquake or from the uh, fault uh, segment, another located about 24 kilometers from the fault segment, acceleration, velocity, and displacement. And in the gray, you see results of this procedure that produce unreliable results. So in other words, the displacement's not stable uh, at the end of the earthquake time series or it just doesn't agree with features that we would expect based off of physics. The ones that are colored represent results that are re relatively reasonable. And you can see we end up getting some final displacement as well as an uncertainty. And so we think that uh, now these results aren't finalized or, or anything, but we think that we're on, on a path towards being able to try to quantify some of these results that might help with certain things down the line. So as far as the future implications of near fault effects go, uh, the, the, the near fault effects are hold significant potential in forensic engineering related to the structural performance during these events. I know that there's a lot of damage, especially in the southern end of the fault, where directivity is, is uh, expected to occur, and we see it in some of the, the events. So if we were to, uh, to try to correlate some of these effects with some of the performance, whether or not directivity played a factor or not, that, I think that's a, a, a pretty important thing. The other thing is we can improve or constrain future predictive models because we have all this data. There are some very crude models, I will say, of predicting fling steps. So that's what this DP is. It's the displacement um, from the fault. And here we have distance from the fault. You can see we do have some data. Most of it is from the 1999 Chi Chi event. 
But for the most part, it's a pretty wide scatter and be interesting to see where the Turkey data points line up and whether or not we can constrain um, a lot of the data between uh, this 0.1 to, to five kilometers or so. And at the end of the day, this just means that better models translates to lower uncertainty and hopefully improved design. Now, the last section of, of, of content that I'd like to discuss today is spatial analyses. And so first to just remind everyone of some definitions, a total residual is the difference of a observation minus a prediction. Event term is that average uh, between 200 kilometers. If we had unbiased results with respect to, to distance, we could just take the average and that's represented by the event bias as mentioned before. But we have these trends, which is why we only take the average where the data is stable. This last definition is a within event residual, which is just taking the difference are subtracting the event term from the total residual. So we end up, if we look at a site down here, within event residual is just this offset between the site and the event bias. In other words, this is trying to quantify the path and side effects kind of contained at one. So we can look at spatial, uh, spatial trends using these within event residuals. So using those within, within event residuals, we've uh, developed some spatial correlation models that account for Euclidean distance and as multiple distance on the correlation, which is a uh, row. So Euclidean distance, if we take two points, I and J, is just the distance normally that we think of between two sites. For example, two to two kilometers if they're located two kilometers away from each other. As multiple distance is the azimuth from some reference point, in this case, the epicenter between two points. So it's a quantification of the path uh, similarity between these two uh, sites. Now, being very brief, uh, Remen Kertel has been leading the effort in developing these models, but he's developed correlation models for Euclidean distance and azimuthal distance. And to summarize the findings, what we find is sites that are nearby one lot, each other have relatively high correlation. Sites that are far away from each other have low correlation. Sites with similar paths have high correlation. Sites with different paths have low correlation. This is all very intuitive, but it's difficult to quantify, which is what these correlation models represent. Lastly, I just want to touch back on this schematic over here. If we add a, a third site, site K, if it is the same Euclidean distance from site I, then the, the, the Euclidean correlation is going to be the same. But we know that the path is much similar because this DA is, is smaller than the, the DA for IJ, which means that the correlation between I and K is going to be much stronger than I and J, which becomes a significant factor when you want to develop some sort of spatial prediction or spatial uh, interpolation. We've used these correlation models along with within event residuals from the observation. So we know each uh, latitude longitude where the within event residual st stands. And we apply ordinary Kriging to uh, get a mean within event residual, which is what's shown in these results, as well as associated uncertainty of the interpolation error, which isn't shown in these plots. So in these plots, the, these are for the magnitude 7.8 PGA on the top, PSA at 0.3 and one second on the bottom. Areas of white have average shaking, or if they're outside of the, the oval, essentially are beyond the usable range of the ground motion model. Areas of red and are stronger than shaking, blue are weaker than shaking. And interestingly, what we see is that there's pretty clear distinction along that are that we interpret to be based on tectonic or crustal properties with the Anatolian plate generally being blue. So it has the weaker than average shaking. This would mean that our within our, our residuals are, are plotted lower. Whereas the Arabian plate is red, stronger than average. These might account for some of those path effects that we saw previously, but that's a bit of speculation. Uh, I think it maybe not speculation is the best word, but it's a kind of a hypothesis, I think would, would be better to describe it. However, as far as impacts, that's just a, a, an, an analysis. As far as how, to, how this is impactful, it comes to ground motion estimation, where we can estimate a ground motion at for any given location, given a ground motion prediction. This comes from something I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Our event terms, which we talked about previously. And then within event residuals, which we can query any point on this map, whether or not there was a, a ground motion record or not. And we can in turn essentially get a, a mean and an uncertainty of a of a ground motion estimate that in uh in lack that for any site that lacks any instrumentation so this is essentially filling in the gaps where we're missing ground motion estimates so the implications of this is as i've mentioned before we can infer spatial effects in the region this is most uh 
best tied to path effects. However, the bigger approach is that it, it, this approach can provide reasonable ground motion estimates. So case history type analyses will be impacted. And so we've worked with various teams of, of researchers um, who have been a part of the EERI gear reconnaissance or the NIST reconnaissance. And we've provided estimates for them at building sites, dam sites, hospitals, lifelines, liquefaction locations, so that they can use them in their analyses. And just one example of how it can be useful is, is because I'm a geotech, I'm going to tie this into to liquefaction, is typically when we're developing models, we have some sort of demand on the y-axis and resistance on the x-axis. So in this case, demand will be tied into PGA. So we can add on the Turkish data points to this plot which hopefully the PGA will be reasonable and it won't be unreliable because if you just take the closest um, recording, it may or may not match your site condition if it's several kilometers away. And so there's a, a lot of factors that go into why or why not certain ground motions may or not be a, applicable for your site condition. But these models may shift and these models that I'm showing here are liquefaction triggering curves. So this can go into to design whether or not you have to consider liquefaction in your study or not. And obviously this has, has many other applications because any case history type analysis um, will be impacted by, by these estimates. So lastly, I'd like to just close it off with some summary and conclusionary remarks. So the first is, as I mentioned at the start, that the curated ground motion data for the four events that I presented throughout this, uh, uh, this time, as well as all of the metadata is available in an online publication. I'll go ahead and post the link in the chat after uh, I conclude uh, this, uh, my time. When it comes to the data and ground motion models, the biggest imp impact is that it fills in much needed gaps in our databases to help constrain empirically based ground motion models. So this is true for large magnitude active shallow crustal type events, specifically shallow uh, strike slip, which um, previously we really only had the Wenchuan uh, aftershock, which is the, the biggest one. Now we have a couple uh, more very large earthquakes. We, we have many near field records, so we can hopefully better capture the um, magnitude scaling, as well as many high amplitude records, which contain nonlinear effects. So that can be used in both ground motion modeling as well as time history type analyses. Notable feature of the data set is the uh, sheer amount of near field records for the magnitude 7.8 aftershock, which uh, will definitely provide insights into directivity and things that, and here I'm just listing again the, the numbers of records that we have within various distance ranges, because I think it's it's quite, uh, quite uh, um, uh, a great part of this data set, just the sheer number of, of near, for, near source records. And then fourthly, with the spatial analyses, which again, I feel personally is, is probably the most impactful point because it ties directly the most into ground motions themselves, is that we can uh, assess spatial trends up in the ground motions and help constrain future ground motion models. This would be, for example, in constraining path models, whether certain uh, blocks or regions have faster or slower attenuation, but also for any case history type analyses like liquefaction, triggering, and other things like that, we can provide uh, better provide um, demand estimates that are used to develop those models. And the last statement that I want to just end with is that it's our job as researchers and engineers to learn from these these data and to improve the future. And so these were just some implications or impacts that, that I wanted to highlight. But I'm sure that there are other researchers and we'll, we'll see other um, applications as part of uh, the later presentations during this seminar. I'd like to quickly just flash some of the references that I've shown. And with that, I'd like to end it here. And then much of the technical content that I showed during this presentation will be um, hopefully published during the Earthquake Spectra special, Turkey special issue uh, early next year. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, this was really interesting presentation. And I'm looking forward to continuing to follow the work you're going to be doing, um, particularly with NJOS3 and seeing how you're incorporating these ground motions and how that's affecting the models. Um, so thank you. And I appreciate you posting that um, link to the data set as well in the chat after we're finished. Up next, we have uh, Professor Osman Osbulut and he will be speaking about um, in ground motions from a structural lens. He's a professor of civil engineering in the Department um, of Civil Engineering at University of Virginia. 
And his research is primarily focused on new generation of resilient and sustainable infrastructure, um, particularly with looking at structural systems. And with that, I will let him continue with this presentation. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation for this uh, presentation. So, um, so my talk uh, actually will uh, build up on, uh, the, on the previous talk, where uh, this time I will be focusing more uh, on the effects of those ground motions uh, uh, on the structures. Um, so um, as uh, Tristan mentioned, uh, the Turkey lies in a really uh, seismically active region. Uh, and uh, the, on uh, February 6, uh, in uh, local time early in the morning, there was a there was this uh, magnitude 7.7 .7 event, uh, uh, followed by many aftershocks, uh, one of them with a magnitude of 6.6 .6, uh, uh, near to the, uh, the main, uh, main shock event. And, and then uh, about nine hours later, there was uh, another event uh, with a magnitude of 7.6, about uh, uh, like uh, 50 miles away uh, from the, the first main, uh, first event or the main shock event. Uh, and, and, and as uh, uh, Tristan mentioned, this uh, uh, another event uh, about two weeks later uh, also contributed to the significant damage, especially in the uh, south part of the, 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 the country. So uh, uh, that was also included in, in some of the analysis. Uh, so um, if we if you want to understand uh, the, the 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 region that was affected from this earthquake, basically it consists of eleven different uh, uh, provinces. Uh, the the white uh, the here uh, marked as uh, over two hundred miles this uh, uh, the white of uh, the width of the region. Uh, and if you want to get an understanding how uh, that region compares, uh, like uh, I normally live in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, uh, that goes from you know the Charlottesville up to the New York, uh, and, and currently I am at, at Leeds for my sabbatical at the University of Leeds, and, uh, and if we look at this, you know, the uh, 320 miles, it's almost entire uh, United uh, Kingdom. Um, uh, so, um, the, uh, after those e events, uh, if you look at the, the structural damage, we see that uh, um, over, 200, over 330,000 buildings were marked as collapsed, need to be demolished uh, immediately or heavily damaged. Uh, those, uh, those numbers uh, th or those number of buildings corresponds to over 500 uh, 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 18 uh, apartments. Uh, if you simply multiply those by three or four, we can uh, get an understanding of the impact of the uh, of those those you know the damages or the collapse on the uh, local population. Uh, and if we if we look at the the distribution of the damage to the different uh, uh, cities, uh, as I mentioned, there are eleven uh, different cities affected by. Uh, by this this event, uh, but the the major uh, majority of the, uh, the the damage was in three cities. Those are the Karamanmaraş, Malatya, and Hatay. And most of my uh, my uh, exploration has been on those uh, three cities. Uh, uh, however. Uh, today I will be talking about the, the one of them. Uh, before that, I just want to uh, uh, like highlight that it's really important that uh, we consider each of this uh, uh, this provinces separately uh, because uh, like the the, the the events affected them in in different uh, uh, ways. So uh, for example, here you see the the ground motion records uh, measured in the city center of the Hatay, uh, and uh, we can see that. Uh, like uh, the, uh, for uh, for this particular city, this first event, uh, 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 and and then the the two weeks later, the aftershock two weeks later was the major uh, the event uh, uh, for uh, for uh, for the city. Uh, however, the, this uh, this um, uh, seven point six uh, event uh, didn't uh, contribute much uh, to the uh, seismic uh, uh, damage in the in the region. Uh, so uh, um, today I want to focus on uh, on Karaman Marash, uh, the, the city of the Karaman Marash, and look at the, the, the recorded ground motion records in this city, and uh, also uh, uh, um, kind of uh, 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 evaluate the, 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 the observed damage on, in, in the city and try to understand the, some of the reasons uh, for uh, the extent of the uh, damage. Uh, so be, before um, I start um, uh, 
presenting some uh, some of the ground motion uh, record uh, analysis, I wanted to show you some images of the city. The, here is the city center, and there are different streets uh, uh, labeled here. And uh, uh, we will look at uh, some of some of them in in this upcoming slides. Uh, here is uh, uh, one of the uh, the the, the uh, boulevard, uh, uh, and you see some uh, like a. Uh, eight to ten story uh, reinforced concrete buildings uh, located in this region, but uh, the, after the event, uh, most of them uh, uh, like a turn uh, into a rubble. Um, and here is, is uh, another boulevard at a triple boulevard uh, uh, in the city center again. Uh, look at this. Um, um, let me get the pointer so look at this uh, uh the the street uh, line and and you can see all of those uh, those uh, uh buildings uh, uh, uh collapsed uh so here is another example uh again we are at the city center uh, different uh, street uh, uh look at this uh, this buildings one of them uh, collapsed here a couple of other rc buildings collapsed as well uh, it goes on, uh, uh, and here is is just another example, uh, and and we see those uh, those buildings, uh, 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 and after the event, again they uh, they uh, uh, collapse or uh, got heavy damage. Uh, see, uh, look at the the building complex here, uh, almost half of them were uh, gone after the earthquake. So uh, those photos come from uh, uh, from this website where they actually took the uh, the. This pictures nine months nine months before the earthquake and nine uh, after the earthquake uh, and 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 compare the uh, the outcome. So um, um, uh, and um, the Karaman Marash includes the epicenter of uh, both of these main events. As, uh, and uh, there were uh, as uh, as mentioned in the earlier uh, presentation, there were a dense. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 seismic network in the region, including uh, the uh, city of the Karaman Marash. Uh, so um, uh, here you see all the all different uh, stations uh, uh, in the city uh, operated by different networks. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, during the two events, uh, uh, not all of those uh, stations uh, uh, provided the uh, data, uh, but the data set that I used in the following analysis comes from actually uh, the Tristan's and, uh, and the, um, uh, the his colleagues' uh, work, uh, and and I downloaded the the ground motion data from Design Safe, uh, and and the, actually. Um, it was uh, the, the processing method or the selection method was uh, described in the earlier presentation. Uh, and there were a, a number of other records uh, that I included in this uh, presentation, uh, downloaded from the AFAT website uh, or Earthquake Data Center System of the Turkey. Uh, I realized that this, uh, uh, this data set uh, uh, downloaded in late March uh, so there were uh, like the AFAT was keep updating the, the their uh, databases. I, I'm not sure if the selected uh, the records or the uh, the records from selected stations were not included intentionally in the design safe or not. Uh, but uh, those are only a few stations, and I mark clearly in the upcoming presentations. So um, uh, uh, I I use the the uh, ground motion rec acceleration record uh, and and then process the uh, the data by myself and obtain the several intensity measures uh, such as the PGA, PGV, spectral acceleration, spectral velocity, spectral displacement, uh, and, and uh, RES intensity, which is a cumulative uh, 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 index that consider the, the amplitude, uh, the, the frequency content and the duration, and then the significant duration of the, uh, the records uh, here, I, I choose it uh, from five to 95% of the the, the the RS intensity development uh, interval uh, and and then the the, uh, the predominant uh, period of the uh, ground motion records were obtained from the uh, power spectral uh, density uh, uh, analysis. So uh, the uh, one more time, uh, the, uh, available stations from these two events, two major events, uh, uh, are shown in this uh, in this plot. Uh, so uh, we see the city center here uh, in the middle, uh, the uh, part of the uh, the map, uh, and and then the the, the wider region. So um, the, the uh, in my analysis, I I look at the ground motion records. Uh, uh, separately, the first this set of uh, stations, which are, are far away from the the city center, 
uh, and also uh, just focus on the ground motion records uh, measured at the city center because most of the, the buildings that I will um, the show as an example for the damage are, are located at the city center. So uh, the, the ground motion records at the city center or the, the seismic stations at, at the city center are shown uh, in this, uh, in this uh, image. Uh, and, and we see that like there are uh, seven stations uh, uh, or the, the, the data from seven stations from the first event. And then we have four, uh, uh, four uh, records from the second event. Uh, these three additional events from the, uh, from the first uh, event are only available from the, uh, the AFAD. Uh, it was not included in, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the data set uh, uploaded in, in uh, design uh, safe. So, um, and if you look at the stations at the city center more closely uh, and look at uh, how uh, the, their uh, site condition, uh, the, basically these two station uh, in the south, uh, 4624 and 4625, uh, they are uh, located on a soft soil uh, while all the other uh, stations uh, can be considered uh, to, uh, in a, a stiff soil uh, site. And um, the first, if you look at the PGAs from both events, magnitude 7.7 .7 and 7.6, the first and second main events. Uh, and, and here you see the, the, the design uh, PGA uh, level and uh, the MC level, PGA level, uh, uh, MC level PGA uh, defined from in Turkish uh, uh, seismic code. Uh, and it, we can uh, see that during this uh, first event, especially the stations at uh, near the uh, uh, or located at soft soil uh, has PGA va values uh, over uh, uh, somewhat over than the uh, uh, design level PGAs. Uh, uh, there are also several other stations. We have uh, quite high PGAs. Uh, and during the second event uh, in the city center, the PGA levels uh, mostly remain below uh, 0.1 G for the city center. Of course, these, uh, these, uh, the, 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 the ground motion records are uh, recorded, were recorded by only two, uh, two uh, you know, the horizontal direction, and one uh, vertical direction uh, at the seismic station, but the, the, the major principal axis of the building may not uh, align with this you know the the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the recorded uh, direction. So uh, that's why here I also uh, calculated the uh, this um, uh, rot the uh, uh, fifty and rot the one hundred, uh, which can be defined as the fifteen percent or the median uh, response quantity and the one hundred one hundred percent or the maximum response uh, quantity, considering the uh, the the. Uh, the, the the different orientations of the measured uh, ground motion record, and if you look at the PGA uh, PGAs, uh, considering this directionality effect, uh, still uh, we see that uh, the most of this uh, ground motion records measured uh, in the city center has uh, the, uh, their maximum in in one of this uh, uh, you know the east west or not not uh, north south direction, uh, and. Uh, if we look at the peak ground velocities, uh, we see uh, uh, again this uh, two stations in the, located on the soft soil has uh, quite large uh, uh, PGV values, um, uh, and and from the second event, the magnitudes are uh, relatively uh, smaller, but uh, still uh, a few events uh, uh, or the, the recording from a few stations past the design level uh, PGVs. Uh, and and to understand uh, the why we had this peak, you know large PGVs in in this uh, stations for the six twenty four and for the six twenty five, and when we look at the 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 record here, we can see this clear uh, uh, the pulse um, uh, uh, with the period of three point three seconds, which uh, you know the amplify the the PGV values for uh, for the site. Um, and if we uh, look at the areas intensity, uh, um, in the, from the first event, uh, we have quite high areas intensity measurements, again, uh, mainly from these two stations on the soft soil, but two other stations at the near the central uh, city center. Uh, and the, the second event, again, uh, compared to the first event, produced uh, considerably uh, lower uh, areas intensities. Here, the maximum value is one, here is five. Uh, so, uh, and if you look at the significant duration, uh, the, the most of the events had a, a like a significant duration between 40 and 50 uh, seconds during both uh, 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 
uh, first uh, grand, uh, first event and the second event. And the predominant period of the 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 this, um, uh, grand motion records uh, varies uh, um, uh, for the first event mostly between 0.5 and one uh, 1.5 a second uh, for these two you know the uh, soft soil uh, stations and we have a, a, a lower peri uh, periods for the other uh, you know the uh, other stations here for some of the components but while for the other components were. Uh, we we see quite a large uh, period. So the the, the period uh, content of the, the or the frequency content of the ground motions uh, were uh, quite um, different for different stations. Uh, and if you look at the spectral accelerations, so for, for the city center, we will look at those uh, uh, those spectral accelerations for three different uh, parts of this T. So these three um, uh, stations. Uh, the, their um, their um, spectral acceleration spectral demands were most, uh, mostly lower than the, the design level uh, 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 spectra uh, uh, and here this design spectra is is given for the city center and uh, is kept constant in the following uh, uh, following uh, slides as well so uh, they are not necessarily at a different the location of the different uh, stations uh, so uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, these two stations for 4620 and 4621, uh, their spectral uh, demands are, are higher compared to the, uh, the previous set of the stations. Uh, and, 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 and the soft soil uh, um, stations or the stations located on, on the soft soil uh, produce considerably uh, like the larger uh, spectral demands uh, at uh, uh, different periods, and uh, in this images, I focus on this 0.5 and 1.5 second uh, because most of the, the buildings uh, uh, in the city center were uh, reinforced concrete buildings with, uh, let's say, six to uh, 15 story. Uh, 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 so, uh, if you look at that region, uh, we can see that uh, the some of the spectral uh, demands uh, 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 at certain periods were higher than the design level demand. And, and, and here you see the this vertical component of the ground motion uh, record. Uh, so the uh, relatively the, at long periods, relatively higher spectral demands were, were present compared to the, the, the code specified uh, vertical uh, spectra. And uh, if you look at the directionality effects for um, uh, uh, from the this uh, spectrum, uh, uh, this is a, a response spectrum from the station for the six twenty five. We can see that the uh, the uh, the this um, uh, at different period uh, the the maximum direction of the uh, the ground motion was was different. So the, the uh, at certain uh, certain um, periods, the polarization is higher, uh, but uh, overall, uh, this uh, road D100 uh, was uh, about 20% uh, higher uh, than the average uh, uh, or the ro uh, rod D50 medium value of the spectral acceler uh, accelerations uh, uh, for different stations, uh, at least uh, at least 20%. And uh, if we look at the, the spectral accelerations during the second event for the city center, we can see that now uh, we have uh, considerably lower uh, spectral demands for uh, lower periods, including this period range of 0.5 to the 1.5, but at higher periods, uh, the, the, the demands uh, 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 even uh, surpass the, the design level uh, demands uh, for some stations. Uh, again, the, the vertical uh, 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 vertical component of the ground motion produce higher uh, higher uh, spectral demands at uh, relatively long periods, and the spectral velocities from uh, all these different stations within the city center. Uh, um, if you look at those again, these two stations from the soft soil has the highest spectral velocities. Uh, and the spectral velocities were uh, quite significant uh, in, 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 in some of those uh, stations. Uh, and uh, for the second event, then the, the magnitude of the spectral uh, velocities, uh, uh, similar to the other intensity measures, were lower uh, for the city center. But uh, uh, I just want to highlight uh, for the second event, this uh, higher period range uh, had also quite uh, uh, significant spectral velocities. 
So if we summarize those findings for the city center, we can say that uh, this magnitude 7.7 .7 event, the first event uh, uh, produced uh, on average at design level, uh, uh, you know, the demands on the structures, uh, whereas the soil structures had uh, higher uh, intensities uh, for different uh, uh, ground motion uh, uh, parameters. Uh, and uh, uh, when we look at the, or if we include the directionality effects, uh, the, the, uh, we had about 20% higher spectral accelerations at different stations uh, compared to the uh, median uh, values of the, uh, the uh, spectral accelerations. So uh, quickly, I will also show the the this uh, uh, the available measurements from the uh, the wider uh, ST, the greater Mirage. I call here. Uh, this is just for completeness. And again, the, my focus will be on the the, the building damage on the uh, on the city center. Uh, but uh, uh, it's also important to you know to note that this uh, really high level events uh, around the you know the the city. Uh, so here uh, first. Uh, uh, the, this uh, we will look at the, the results from the north uh, and the south part uh, differently. There are different stations where we have uh, recordings for the the seven point seven event, uh, and uh, and those stations uh, uh, like measure quite high uh, PGAs, including one of them here uh, as high as two point two G, uh, but the the rest were uh, mostly. Uh, 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 like oh, over the design levels for uh, for those uh, uh, those stations closer to the, the epicenter of the uh, first event, uh, and if we look at the uh, the spectral accelerations uh, for the south part of the region, uh, it's uh, the the first event was in the in the north uh, of the city, so the the spectral demands are. Uh, are relatively lower, but then we look at the this uh, the north part of the city uh, in 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 different stations closer to the you know the fall. We have extremely high spectral uh, demands, uh, and here are the the spectral demands from these three uh, the stations. Again, they are uh, quite high, especially this middle uh, period range, uh, and of course um, uh, the the the. Pulse-like ground motions were uh, were uh, uh, observed more uh, on those uh, records. Here you, you see just some examples with uh, you know the very high uh, PGV values. And the, if you look at the second event for the Greater Mirage, uh, again uh, we will look at those results uh, uh, first. Uh, the PG uh, uh, results and again this uh, station closer to the epicenter this time the south, uh, south part of the city has quite high values uh, while uh, the the spectral accelerations on this uh, on this part again were over the the demand levels uh, on the other hand the, the the south part of the region has uh, you know spectral accelerations lower than uh, the design level uh, and the uh, directionality was more uh, more apparent for uh, the ground motion records uh, uh, the, uh, close to those uh, region, this wider region, because they are actually uh, closer to the fault, uh, and we see quite strong polarization for different uh, different periods. Uh, so for the greater Mirage, again, for completeness, uh, it should be noted that the, the spectral demands were, were quite uh, were quite high. The first event, you know, the, the punch, the, uh, the south part of the, the city, while the second event really uh, caused significant uh, spectral uh, demands in the north part of the city. Um, but now coming back to the city center, uh, before we look at the specific buildings, uh, the, just to, you know, the FV, uh, quick information about the, uh, the, the Turkish uh, um, seismic design code, uh, uh, typical to any code, it, it evolved uh, uh, during the, you know, the years. Uh, there was a major, uh, you know, the improvement in 1975 uh, and then in 1998 uh, and, 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 uh, 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 most recently in 2018, uh, the, the building code was updated to incorporate, uh, you know, the, uh, the, and, and uh, many of the uh, modern uh, uh, seismic uh, uh, code requirements. Uh, and uh, here, the, uh, one of the important uh, thing to note uh, is that in 2001, there was a 
building inspection law introduced uh, in the country after 99, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the earthquake in the region. Uh, and, and, and however, um, those uh, building inspection law uh, uh, introduced only for 19 provinces as a pilot uh, 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 implementation uh, and uh, only these three cities uh, were included among those 19 provinces and the Maharaj was not among them and in 2011 it enforced in all provinces and improved the, uh, this uh, the the construction practices or expected to improve the construction practices uh, in the in the uh, uh, region and in uh, more recently it was uh, further improved uh, such that there are more transparency in this inspection uh, laws uh, and, and similarly, seismic hazard maps uh, evolved, uh, and, and, and in 1996, there were five zones uh, describing the, the hazard for, uh, for different cities, uh, but uh, in 2018, those hazard maps were updated uh, to consider uh, uh, the uh, various, uh, various other parameters, and, and now you can uh, more, uh, more specific, uh, spe or the, the uh, the spectral demands uh, can be obtained for uh, any site uh, uh, from uh, the, the the map provided by uh, uh, by the AFAD. Uh, so, uh, and if you look at the material uh, quality and the requirements for the material used in this reinforced concrete buildings, uh, uh, again, uh, the uh, um, the compressive strength of the the concrete uh, has remained relatively low, uh, although it was improved uh, through uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, throughout the you know the the uh, updates on the co building code uh, and in 2001 uh, one after 99 uh, 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 earthquake isn't earthquake uh, the the ready mix concrete uh, was uh, 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 enforced for all the applications before that uh, uh, like a uh, the, the quality of the concrete was even uh, lower. Uh, so the, uh, and the rain for the reinforcing steel, uh, we see this plain rebars are being uh, used uh, uh, or, uh, in, in, in some of the, the uh, uh, older buildings, uh, but uh, the, in 2017, uh, they were not allowed anymore. However, there was no specific, you know, the, the strength, yield strength to find on the code. Uh, which was updated uh, in uh, in the latest uh, revision of the uh, the seismic code. Uh, so here um, I calculated the uh, the design base shear uh, following the the this 2007 and 2018 uh, building code and compare it with the uh, uh, the earthquake the seismic demand. Uh, measured uh, from the nearest station. Uh, and for that, uh, I use uh, the, both the ROT D100 uh, uh, measured uh, spectra and also the geometric mean uh, of the, the, uh, the, the two components. Uh, so, um, uh, and the, this, the design base shear, um, if uh, this ratio is less than one, the earthquakes, uh, earthquake loads are smaller than the design loads, while uh, if it is greater than one, then we have earthquake loads are higher than or uh, design loads. And and here are the, some of the details provided in in the in the code uh, how to calculate this uh, the the base shear uh, coefficient and the base shear uh, the uh, design uh, base shear uh, for uh, both. Uh, uh, um, um, both building code. Uh, the, of course, the soil uh, site clef, uh, uh, class is another important parameter, uh, and it was also changed from the 2007 to 2018 code. Uh, but uh, in in this uh, in this analysis, uh, the, the the we consider this. Uh, uh, either stiff soil uh, uh, ZC level or the ZD uh, soft, uh, uh, soil. Uh, and again, if you go back to the city center, we see these buildings, you know, the, uh, the, they are all gone. Uh, here you see this row of the buildings. Again, they all, uh, you know, collapsed uh, and, and, uh, or demolished. And here uh, another set of, you know, the, the uh, relatively high-rise buildings, they uh, most of them uh, were uh, either collapsed or demolished after the event. Uh, so uh, um, uh, if we look at the, uh, if we compare the, the design load um, uh, versus the earthquake load, uh, using the measurements uh, from these four stations uh, closer to the city center, uh, we will see 
uh, and uh, we uh, the this these calculations are uh, conducted for a, a, a ductile uh, uh, frame, concrete frame, uh, reinforced concrete frame, uh, uh, and and we we can see this uh, for for uh, for this station uh, uh, forty six twenty the the earthquake loads uh, were measured mostly uh, lower uh, than the the design load. Uh, but, but when we look at the station 4621, uh, the, 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 this uh, uh, building code uh, 2007, uh, if uh, we look at the geometric mean, it always remains uh, the below the uh, design uh, uh, level uh, uh, loads. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, uh, the earthquake loads competed from this road D100 or the maximum orientation, we can see for some period it's it, it, it is uh, over uh, over the the design level uh, base shear, and if we compare uh, the the 2018 code and in the city center most of the buildings probably is built before this 2018 uh, you know the code uh, we can see this uh, at, especially at higher periods the this uh, 2018 code uh, under uh, or the earthquake loads were higher than the design level uh, base shear. Uh, and similar uh, similar uh, uh, conclusions can be made for this uh, station uh, 4625 and 4624 uh, uh, and 25. Those are the soft soil, uh, you know, the stations. Uh, and if we com uh, compare uh, uh, the uh, 2007 uh, code for the geometric mean, it remains uh, around the base, uh, design uh, base shear code or below the, the, the uh, design base shear. But when we consider the maximum direction, it surpasses sometimes for certain periods. And here again, this plot is showing the uh, demands for uh, structures with a period of 0.5 and 1.5 second. And the second earthquake produced uh, considerably lower uh, demands in, 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 in uh, Almost all of those available uh, stations, uh, or the based on the uh, the measurements from available stations. Uh, however, I want to highlight that, at, uh, especially for uh, higher periods, uh, 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 the second earthquake, you know, the the cause uh, or uh, uh, higher uh, the seismic demands, and that's quite important because uh, uh, the first event uh, kind of. Uh, um, uh, cause certain damage on the buildings and extended the period. And uh, this may have caused some uh, further damage uh, during the second uh, event. And uh, we will look at this, uh, sorry, uh, in this video uh, where uh, you see this event, this building uh, uh, is shaking there is, uh, during the second uh, earthquake, magnitude, magnitude 7.6 uh, Alvistan earthquake, while there's a building at what behind are, uh, that will collapse uh, right now uh, uh, during this uh, the second event. Again, uh, the second event caused higher uh, spectral demands at the longer, relatively longer periods, uh, which uh, might be that uh, you know detrimental for these damaged buildings. And if you look at the 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 site classification or uh, for the city center, the so city was or originally uh, established at the outskirts of this mountain. However, it moved uh, 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 towards the valley to towards the south uh, with the time. Uh, and if we look at the the this uh, soil site condition in the in the city center here, this uh, legend in, is in Turkish, but basically the green. Uh, colors are indicating uh, sulfur uh, soil, uh, while the brown are uh, are the stiffer uh, soil. So we can see the 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 presence of the uh, the uh, the soil sites with uh, uh, soft uh, soil condition, uh, and and the, the uh, uh, and some of those uh, soils uh, actually uh, were, uh, included alluvial deposition, uh, and and we see uh, the 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 city was built on uh, or the high-rise building, uh, relatively high-rise buildings, our city buildings were uh, constructed on this soft soil, which might have contributed to uh, damage. Uh, and uh, the, another at, kind of the characteristics of the, the, the buildings in the region, uh, we, um, the, the, this bottom uh, stories uh, usually has a, 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 a uh, stores and they are set back from the upper floors uh, and uh, those have a uh, cause or led to the some soft story failures as in indicated in this uh, in this figure uh, in the uh, in the uh, buildings uh, region and um, look at this uh, image uh, like uh, this uh, this three buildings 
probably uh, constructed by the same uh, uh, company, same time. Uh, but look at this front one, which includes irregularities in plan. Uh, and that one, uh, you know, the, the uh, collapse during the earthquake while two uh, others uh, are still standing. So those irregularities in plan, whether vertical or the plan irregularities also might have contributed to the damage. And, and, and if we look at this, uh, shear wall buildings uh, in a uh, relatively eastern part of the uh, city. Uh, they are uh, quite new buildings constructed between 2015 to 2018, uh, 15 story buildings. There are 16 uh, blocks uh, here. And uh, during the, the first event, one of the building was reported to the uh, collapse. And the, during the second, another building was reported to collapse. Uh, uh, and then uh, there were significant damage in several others. Uh, actually, uh, uh, many of the, these buildings were demolished after the uh, after the event. Um, so, if we if uh, if we look at the, uh, the 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 seismic demands on this uh, buildings, considering the closest station, uh, this forty six to one, uh, about three kilometer away from the the region. Uh, uh, we see that the, this uh, the 2007 code, which probably uh, used in the design of these buildings, uh, the the um, uh, the raw the geometric mean, if we consider geometric mean of the measured ground motion, is below the design level, but it's relatively you know the higher for the rod uh, rod D 100 uh, uh, ground motion. Uh, so uh, it's about design or less than design level, uh, uh, the shaking uh, uh, for the region. And, and the difference between the, the, this uh, or the, the reason for a higher spectral demands or the higher earthquake, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the demand, uh, load demands in 2018 spectra uh, is because uh, the, the, it was predicting the, or, the, the, or providing lower uh, spectral uh, accelerations, design accelerations, especially for long period uh, region. Uh, and if we if we try to understand the the collapse, the uh, the the reasons for the collapse of those buildings, uh, um, of course it should be looked at more holistically. But uh, the 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 initial uh, initial observations from the site, that's the uh, the photo uh, taken by. Uh, Professor Osgur uh, uh, and 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 we can clearly see that uh, the detailing there are issues in the detailing of this uh, uh, shear wall uh, uh, and uh, the the concrete quality uh, is not uh, looking great uh, and 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 also uh, uh, the this uh, the confinement is not you know the the uh, prepare uh, uh, effectively or, or correctly so uh, the, so this poor poor uh, construction practices were not only present in this uh, you know the building but maybe some other buildings in the uh, region as well uh, and uh, when we look at the, the several hospital build, buildings in the city center, here is the first one, 2012, constructed in 2012, RC shear wall building, uh, and there was a considerable uh, non structural damage in the hospital, and, and it was not, uh, you know, the functional after the event. Uh, and um, the, the, this uh, hospital is in the south part of the, the, the city, and uh, the closest station is this 4625. When we compare the, 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 uh, the earthquake loads, uh, uh, or, or we can see that the, uh, mostly it is below the uh, design uh, base here, but uh, we, we, we have observed significant uh, non-structural damage without uh, damage on the structural uh, system. Uh, uh. And here is another hospital building in the city center uh, where uh, the, uh, the uh, relatively, you know, the, um, the older compared to the other building. Uh, this is a 2003 uh, building, uh, but it's a, uh, like a, maybe it's a six story, you know, the building located in the city center, uh, very close to the station 46, 18 and 19. When we look at the, the seismic demands, uh, th those are uh, considerably lower than the, the design base shear, and the building uh, actually was not uh, damaged. It was occupable uh, and functional after the event. Uh, so uh, another hospital in the uh, the city center uh, was this uh, private hospital built in 2007, uh, but this hospital experienced significant non structural uh, damage, uh, uh, especially the the partition walls. Uh, the 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 structural system initially was not reported. 
uh, to be uh, the, uh, uh, okay, but uh, uh, again, this hospital was uh, uh, demolished after the event. And if we look at the, the seismic demands on this uh, hospital building, the closest station was this for this uh, station for the 620, about two miles uh, away from the uh, the hospital uh, and, and the, the demands were uh, considerably lower uh, co uh, compared to the design uh, uh, loads. So um, if we summarize um, the, 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 uh, in the city center, the damage was heavy for the Karaman Marash and, and the, the, the different reasons contribute to that, including the construction of the, uh, the 10 to 15 story buildings on soft soil. Uh, we have seen uh, soft story mechanisms, uh, poor construction practices, low quality construction uh, materials and compounding impacts of the earthquakes, the first event and, and then the uh, major aftershock. All those, you know, the uh, the contribute to the, the damage in the in the region. Uh, and, and the hospitals, uh, the considerable non-structural damage was observed. Uh, even the, the, the base shear demands were uh, almost half of the design levels. Uh, and the directionality can be considered uh, is, a, is an important uh, effect that, uh, that might uh, need to be uh, accounted uh, for. Uh, and and, and the, uh, the, this uh, 2000 uh, seismic hazard maps, uh, they provide uh, at least for this region, uh, the spectral demands uh, lower uh, than uh, the the previous, uh, and and also the measured you know the uh, the demands uh, at high periods. So with that, uh, I want to thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Professor Osbolt. This was interesting to see. Um... The damages with regard to the structure and how that impacts the um, the buildings themselves individually. Um, I think what we're going to do is, due to time constraints, we want to make sure we have plenty of time for question and answer at the end and have an opportunity for a break. What we're going to do is hold questions until the very end, and we'll have a five minute break right now, and then we'll resume with the remainder of presentations and our question and answer session. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us again. I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Ezra Zengin is a senior researcher at UCLA's Natural Hazards Risk and Resiliency Research Center, um, which she joined in 2022. And her research interests include characterization and modeling of ground motion, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, seismic performance and risk assessment of structures. And with that, I will let Ezra take over. Thank you so much. Okay, hello everyone. Today I will be talking about investigation of damage potential of ground motions of the Pazarcık Turkey earthquake by developing spatial distribution of the inelastic spectra. Here is my outline. I will start by giving brief information on February 6, 2023 Turkey earthquake sequence. Then I will talk about significance of inelastic spectra. I will mention about the background on Turkish earthquake codes. Then I will present our results for recorded ground motion characteristics, as well as ground motion simulation approach that we use for uninstrumented sites. Then I will present inelastic response uh, spectral results and spatial distributions of ductility demand. On February 6, two major earthquakes occurred at the southeastern part of Turkey. On the left figure, I'm showing the epicenter of the Pazarcık earthquake in the East Anatolian fault zone with a moment's magnitude of 7.8, occurred at uh, 4 a.m. local time with a focal depth of uh, 8.9 kilometer. And after nine hours later, magnitude 7.7 .7 Elbistan earthquake occurred at another uh, fault segment northwest of the initial main shock. Uh, and 1,300 uh, aftershocks have been recorded within three days, which were distributed along the fault segments, as you can see here. And main shock resulted in 
uh, pole structure spanning approximately 265 kilometers. On the right figure, I'm showing the USGS seismic intensity map, so-called shake map. Triangles here represents the size, seismograms and uh, showing the dense array of network in the near fault region. Uh, based on the color scale, blue denotes the lower intensity and red indicates higher intensity or severe shaking. And tragically, these earthquake sequences resulted in uh, 50,000 deaths and severe damage or collapse of over 200,000 buildings across 11 cities. Now I'd like to shift the focus to the significance of inelastic spectra. Uh, so the spectral acceleration is a widely used intensity measure to assess the damage potential of the ground motions. It represents the peak acceleration experienced by a linear oscillator, which is characterized by mass, a stiffness, and damping ratio. So how do we obtain this metric? Uh, so if you look at the equation of motion for a given ground motion, the response history of relative displacement is dependent on the uh, single degree of freedom systems, natural frequency, and damping ratio. Uh, so if you look at the maximum absolute relative displacement, we can get the spectral displacement. And uh, so the spectral acceleration can be computed by spectral displacement multiplied by natural frequency C squared. So now let's look at the force deformation relationships of linear and uh, nonlinear non single degree of freedom systems. Uh, we use sort of spectral acceleration to derive the elastic design spectra, but elastic response indicates that the structures remains within its elastic range. However, we design our buildings for lower forces by reducing these forces uh, with some uh, reduction factor. Uh, which leads to structural damage. So a structure experiences deformations beyond its elastic limit. And this inelastic behavior involves yielding plastic deformation and hysteretic energy dissipation. So to quantify the damage potential of a ground motion, we can use ductility demand, which is the ratio of the maximum inelastic displacement to yield displacement. Uh, we propose to use ductility demand because it offers a more direct approach to assessing the ex extent of the structural damage when compared to relying solely on elastic seismic demand measures. So high ductility capacity indicates uh, the structure can absorb more seismic energy through plastic deformation. Now take a closer look at the comparisons of elastic and inelastic responses of bilinear single degree of freedom systems obtained from one of the recordings of the magnitude 7.8 earthquake um, with a rupture distance of 5.5 uh, 5, uh, 5 kilometers. Here we use a nonlinear single degree of freedom system with 2% hardening stiffness ratio and 5% damping ratio characterized by bilinear Takeda hysterical model. In the left panel, you can see the elastic displacement history for a period of one second. And a middle panel shows the inelastic displacement history of that record. And we can see that inelastic displacement demands are larger than the elastic one. And large inelasticity can produce permanent or residual displacement at the end of the analysis. So if you look at the force displacement hysteric behavior uh, of the inelastic system, we'll see large ductility demands in the system imposed by this ground motion. So before we dive into the analysis results of the recorded motion, I'd like to provide a brief background on the seismic design codes. So Turkey is a seismically active country. Uh, North Anatolian Fault and East Anatolian Fault are two major strike slip faults running across the country. And one of the most destructive earthquake was 1999 Kojeli earthquake, which was followed by Düzce earthquake. And these earthquakes revealed the deficiencies in the 1975 Turkish earthquake code, which lacked crucial seismic design concepts, such as capacity design and adequate ductility, which makes pre-1998 uh, um, structures less resilient to seismic events. 
So in 1998, uh, the court introduced the concept of a design earthquake with a return period of 475 years. It implemented the ductile behavior, introduction of strong column weak beam concept, and longitudinal and transverse reinforcement specifications. In 2007 code, um, it focused on earthquake prone regions and emphasized the importance of assessing and retrofitting of existing structures. The latest seismic code, Turkish Building Earthquake Code in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2018, uh, utilizes probabilistic seismic hazard maps and considers four different return periods for site-specific design. Uh, in this code, less critical buildings are evaluated at one performance level, such as control damage at 4, 000, uh, 475 years, and the critical and high-rise buildings undergo assessment at all performance levels across various return periods. But uh, in the February 6 earthquake sequence, both older and modern compliant buildings suffered severe damage and collapse, uh, which emphasized the importance of consistent code application and construction quality for seismic resilience. In our study, we used seven to one stations that were located within 100 kilometers of the fault rupture. Uh, we selected this, this distance range because of their engineering significance. Here, the map shows the selected station locations and their corresponding BS30 values and three fault segments associated with the first main shock. The station label corresponds to four specific stations uh, that will be discussed in following slides. As you can see, mean BS30 values corresponds to 536 meter per second. Uh, and uh, in the Hatay region, uh, corresponding to Southern Fault region, we have stored mostly uh, below 400 meter per second with the lowest recorded value 210 meter per second. The bottom plot shows the PGA uh, and PGV distribution with respect to rupture distance. Uh, we see that PGA showed wide variability at the rupture distance smaller than 20 kilometer and also PGA values from 20 recording stations exceeded the 0.5G level, particularly uh, near the fault. Uh, we also observed pulse-like features in velocity time series of some stations, uh, which could be attributed to forward reactivity effect. However, that was not analyzed uh, within the scope of this study. So we started by comparing the 5% damped response spectra uh, ground motions were also rotated to fold normal and fold parallel direction. Uh, as you can see, these spectral comparisons demonstrated that almost all components uh, exceeded the 475 years design level from 0.4 seconds to 8 seconds. And we observe exceedance cases for the return period 2,475 years. So if you look at the station 2708, uh, the H2 component exceeded 2,475 years by a factor of 1.6 at the period two seconds. And similarly, uh, 31, 39 station exceeded 2,475 years by a factor of 1.8. The other stations also exceeded the 475 year uh, return period by a factor of two at short periods and long periods. And these observations indicated that buildings experience seismic demands beyond design expectation. And it, it appears that the severity of the earthquake was more pronounced for long periods. And given that the most of the buildings uh, in this area are uh, three and 50 story RC buildings, they were likely affected uh, within this period range. And before we delve into the results of inelastic spectra, I'd like to provide some insight into the approach we employed uh, in simulation of our ground motions. Here we use Gaussian process regression, which assumes any finite collection of observations has a multivariate normal distribution. GPs are parameterized by mean and covariance function. Here, the covariance functions are composed of the kernel functions that are defined based on two hyperparameters, amplitude and length scale. 
Amplitude represents the average distance of my functions away from its mean, and length scale describes how smooth a function is. Example of common kernels are exponential, matern, and squared exponential. And from the correlation distance plot, you can see that we cannot expo extrapolate the results uh, distance uh, from L distance away from the data. But uh, the problem is these kernels are isotropic, meaning that they are defined by Euclidean distance between two points. So the process is isotropic. This GPR-based ground motion simulation includes two stages. First, learning. The second one, the inference. In the Bayesian inference, we define our priors and likelihood based on our data to explain the model parameters. Then this stage gives us the distribution of the posterior functions given the data. And the inference stage, we use the posterior functions to form the predictive distribution for the test input. In our study, discrete Fourier transform coefficients are assumed as random Gaussian variables. And we define the covariance function using 4D space, where X, Y, Z are the Cartesian coordinates of this location. And we store the values for the uninstrumented sites um, are obtained using natural neighbor interpolation technique. Okay, now that we learned the underlying appro approach, let's look at the target area. Uh, on the left figure, you can see the distribution of the stations recording the magnitude 7.8 event. And these stations were used to construct GPR model. The rectangular box in that figure uh, represents the simulation area. Uh, simulations covered a grid of four kilometer by four kilometer. So we perform analysis approximately for 6,200 sites. And the model performance is quantified based on normalized root mean square error, uh, which basically shows how well the predicted ground motion spectral values match the actually recorded ground motion spectral values across different uh, periods. On the right figure, you can see uh, different dots with different colors. Here, green dot indicates lower error values, while orange and red dot indicates higher error values or less accurate prediction. So uh, the idea is that um, the, uh, if we use the observed data to construct the GPR model for uninstrumented sites, uh, we can perform the simulation at numerous uninstrumented sites and predict how ductility demand varies across the region for generic structural systems designed in compliance with the modern seismic building code. We then compare the recorded and generated motions uh, for selected three sites near the epicenter region. Uh, we observe that the GPR model performs well at the long period region, but there are some inaccuracies in predicting the short period content. And uh, these results could be attributed to sparsity of the observations to generate accurate short period content and also using an isotropic covariance structure, assuming equal correlations in all directions may not work well in the regions with directional variability, uh, like near fault regions. And then we derive inelastic constant ductility spectra for recorded motions. Uh, which shows the CY of single degree of freedom systems against period for a given ductility level and damping ratio. Uh, the process uh, starts with calculating the maximum displacement response for single degree of freedom systems at 21 periods. We perform calculations for 22 different CY values for each period using OpenSys program. We then determine uh, the ductility demand for each case by dividing the maximum inelastic displacement by the yield displacement. We then define a set of predefined ductility demand values and interpolate our CY values to match these predefined ductility demand values. The right figure shows inelastic constant ductility spectra obtained from geometric mean of two horizontal components of two, these two stations at six ductility levels. 
mu equals one corresponds to elastic behavior and mu equals 1.5 low ductility case. Mu equals uh, five represents high ductility case. And as you can see, the CY demand decreases as the ductility increases, suggesting that designing structures with higher ductility capacities could potentially lead to uh, reduced seismic strength demand. And now we evaluated the CY demand for uh, ductility three case against 475 years design spectra. Uh, to drive the inelastic design spectrum, we divide the elastic design spectrum by ductility reduction factor three. Uh, on the left, it is seen that inelastic spectrum exceeds the inelastic design spectrum, like in the elastic case, but they exceeded the spectrum across a wider uh, range of periods. And on the right, we compare the ratios of the CY demand uh, to CY capacities at 0.5 seconds and one seconds and uh, show the ratios rel relative to the rupture distance. Uh, in this case, uh, the one uh, reference line represents the equal load and equal capacity condition. And results indicate that the CY demand exceeded the capacities by 1.5 to three times, uh, especially at near fault region, rupture distance smaller than 10 kilometer. And this also suggests a potential underestimation of the CY design capac capacities for typical RC buildings uh, by Turkish building earthquake code. Uh, here I'm showing the ductility demands uh, from recorded uh, motions. Uh, we investigated the distance scaling of these mu values with respect to rupture distance uh, using average CY values from recorded values. Uh, you can see that most of the uh, structures uh, or sites within the rupture distance 10 kilometer exceeded ductility level 10. Uh, which suggests a potential structural collapse. And uh, as the period increases, uh, ductility demand increases. And in this case, if you look at the uh, period one second, we see that fault normal component exceeded uh, ductility 15 levels. And we look at the spatial distribution of the ductility demand from magnitude 7.8 earthquake. Uh, using these recorded motions. Uh, we generate the contour maps using the Krieging interpolation technique. Here, uh, pink and red dots indicate heavily damages and collapsed buildings. Uh, these contours, uh, green and red areas, show high ductility demands, and purple areas show low ductility demands. The sudden fault segment showed a clear correlation between uh, mu and observed damage. In this case, ductility demand greater than seven corresponds to substantial damage. And we observe uh, there are some peak values uh, reaching to 13 to 15 in some locations. Especially in the Hatay region, higher ductility values were more pronounced uh, at period one second compared to 0.5 seconds. Uh, here, any discrepancies between ductility demand and actual damage uh, can be resulted from the absence of the recordings in those regions, because interpolation uh, could not capture those areas. And it's also essential to note that uh, the structures in these regions were subsequently subjected to a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake, uh, a factor uh, uh, not considered in this study. And using recorded and uh, simulated ground motions, again, we produce these ductility maps. Um, and we observe that the regions with high ductility demand values corresponded to the areas with significant structural damage or collapse. Uh, we see that the simulated motions provided reasonably accurate prediction of the spatial distribution of the ductility demand, especially in areas with the art recording stations, uh, such as uh, eastern part of the Turkey or northern Syria. 
Uh, however, the accuracy of these ductility demand predictions dependent on the uh, error prediction of these recording stations while developing the GPR model. Uh, for example, stations with error values exceeding 0.5 resulted in higher spectral amplitudes and consequently leading uh, higher ductility predictions. Also, we noted inconsistencies between ductility demands and actual damage data at some regions. And these inconsistencies were attributed to poor performance of the GPR model uh, with stations having high error values. And it is also important to note that we all only investigate the damage potential using the first main shock, uh, while these damage data represents the combined effect of uh, two uh, earthquakes. So in conclusion, uh, our studies show that ground motions from Pazarjuk main shock revealed uh, yield strength demand exceed the seismic design codes, particularly for rupture distance smaller than 10 kilometer. And also incorporating the ductility demand maps uh, into earthquake assessment offers a more practical and precise evaluation of the potential damage of seismic performance of the buildings. The simulation approach that we propose here reasonably predicted variations in ductility demand, uh, highlighting the high demand regions associated with significant structural damage or collapse. Uh, so the final note uh, for uh, our results, uh, GPR method shows promise for simulating ground motions in uninstrumented areas, especially for quick post-earthquake damage assessment. By increasing the efficiency of this approach, producing the maps of the damage potential of the ground shaking in near real time is possible. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zingin. Um, we really appreciate you joining us for this presentation today. Um, up next, we have Dr. Grace Parker. She's a research geophysicist at the USGS Earthquake Science Center. Her focus is on understanding and modeling earthquake ground motions with a special interest in seismic site response. Um, she's also been involved in part of the NGA East and NGA subduction zone projects that have been adopted as well for the national USGS National Seismic Hazard Maps. And with that, Grace, I'll let you take over. Thanks, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, let me just try to move my Zoom bar. There we go. Okay, uh, thanks so much for having me today. I'm uh, really happy to be here and be able to give my talk. Uh, and I'll be discussing uh, the characterization of source, path, and side effects on ground motions from the 2023 Turkey earthquake sequence. And this is work that I've done in collaboration with Anne-Marie Valte, as well as other collaborator collaborators uh, from the USGS in Turkey. And um, in this work, our focus is really on understanding the physical processes generating uh, the ground motions in the earthquake sequence uh, to quantify and understand the reasons that they might differ from the median expected behavior as modeled by ground motion models or GMMs, and to understand the factors controlling the observed variability. So here we're going to use the ground motion models as a tool to understand the physics behind the observed shaking, and um, along the way perhaps develop some new methods or insights that can inform future ground motion model development. So um, as you've seen from previous talks, this was an extremely uh, damaging earthquake sequence that occurred near the triple junction between the African and Arabian plates and the Anatolian block. Um, the first magnitude 7.8 earthquake ruptured much of the southwestern portion of the eastern Anatolian fault, as well as the northernmost portion of the Dead Sea fault and was followed nine hours later by the magnitude 7.5 earthquake on a conjugate fault to the north of the first epicenter. 
And um, this earthquake sequence follows the 2020 magnitude 6.7 earthquake that occurred to the north or further to the north along the East Anatolian Fault. And these uh, plots are the two USGS shape maps for the largest earthquakes. And because um, I think I'm the only speaker from the USGS in this webinar series, I really I wanted to really briefly highlight some of the involvement in the post-earthquake response across the USGS. Um, of course, most of this work was done in collaboration with many institutions, including those in the US and in Turkey. And so, um, you know, post-earthquake, the USGS has some of its flagship earthquake hazard products, including ShapeMap and Pager. Uh, I showed the shape maps on the previous slide. Um, but they also develop, we also develop finite faults uh, for large global earthquakes. And this is led by uh, Derek Goldberg and Norton Yak. And that's what this slide is showing uh, for the main shock on the top and then the largest aftershock on the bottom. Uh, for this earthquake, the USGS also developed trainings through VHA. So Mehmet Chalabi led trainings on uh, structural health monitoring. And then the aftershock forecasting team, uh, Vander Else, Paige Schneider, and McBride developed trainings on aftershock forecasting. And I'll also note that um, Mehmet Chalabi led a large effort to put together the VHA proposal that allowed many of the people listed here to travel to Turkey and participate in this post event response. So we had a team that went and looked at ground failure and surface rupture. Uh, we have Kishore Jaiswal, who looked at structural performance. And he's giving a talk on October 10th, I believe, as part of the Geologic Hazard Science Center on that work. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to check that out. And then we also had a team from our center that uh, traveled to Turkey and deployed a joint USGS AVAD nodal earthquake monitoring array. And that's what this map shows. So uh, the dark blue dots are the were the existing um, AVAD strong motion stations, and then the green squares are the nodes that this team deployed and the pink square shows the nodes that were deployed in um, a multi-story building. So a total of 126 nodal seismometers um, were deployed in July 2023 as a part of this effort. And then um, I also want to plug the USGS Earthquake Science Center uh, seminar archive, which can be viewed um, by this QR code. And in March and April, we had two talks that are archived there related to this earthquake sequence. So if you're interested, I would also encourage you to check out those out. Okay, so today I'll be focusing on the analysis of an ensemble data set of earthquake ground motions that Brad Agard at the Geologic Hazard Science Center in Golden uh, compiled in April using the USGS open source GM process software package. And Brad um, compiled ground motions from 68 magnitude five plus earthquakes in Turkey from 2010 through March 23rd, uh, 2023. And the map on the right hand side shows the epicenters of those earthquakes uh, where the size indicates the magnitude. So the majority of them are from this earthquake sequence um, source zone, but not all of them. And um, we started with the raw mini seed format available from AVOD. And after processing them, Brad manually inspected each process time series. And we're, Brad is working with uh, CGS to release the flat files that came out of this effort as a CESMD special, uh, I think they're called special studies, um, a data release. And that's similar to what the USGS has done um, for previous ground motion data sets, like for the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. Um, and so here are the two largest earthquakes from this sequence. And then that uh, 2020 magnitude 6.7 earthquake that occurred uh, to the northeast on the East Anatolian Fault. And here are 
the stations um, that recorded ground motions in this data set. There are over a thousand stations for a total of about 9,600 three component records. Um, and a large number of stations, um, which is shown in the different colors, recorded upwards of 20 to 30 um, earthquakes as a part of this data set. And of course, that number falls off as you move farther from the source zone and the signal to noise ratio uh, decreases. So if you filter by the number, filter the stations by um, those that recorded three or more records, um, this is what the map looks like. But there's still um, really great spatial coverage. And I'll also mention here, uh, while looking at this plot, that the reason we're interested in this type of ensemble data set approach is that it makes it much easier to estimate repeatable path and site effects and separate those from other source effects like um, variations in amplitude or their activity. Uh, when the ground motions are sampled from many different earthquakes in different locations. So having 30 records per station makes it much easier to develop site response estimates. And then the better those are, that propagates into your estimates of the other components. And since um, those sorts of, that sort of physical understanding is what we're interested in, this type of analysis um, suits our needs. And so I mentioned that Brad used the USGS um, GM process software package, which is um, an automated Python-based code. It's available uh, to download and install from our USGS GitLab repository. Um, and you can use the QR code on the top right or this link here um, to take a look at that. So this uh, software package allows users to compile ground motions. It interfaces directly with FDSN um, web services and CESMD, for example, to download time series. It has a number of QA checks. Uh, you can process and filter the time series and then compute ground motion metrics, including um, response spectra, so pseudospectral acceleration, PSA, Fourier amplitude spectra, areas intensity, and duration for a number of different um, horizontal component combinations, so the different channels, rot D50, um, et cetera. You can also calculate, uh, it also automatically calculates sources like distances. You can generate plots and maps. And kind of importantly for USGS products, you can send ground motion packets to ShapeMap along with the provenance information about those ground motions, so where they came from and how they were processed. And that helps us make sure all of our hazard products are, are self-consistent. Uh, it was designed to mimic the NGA procedures uh, given in Enchetta et al. 2014. And of course, um, it's fully automated, so not every step is the same. Um, in particular, choosing the, the corner frequencies for the filtering is automated in GM process, whereas traditionally uh, the NGA product projects have done that manually. Um, however, there are multiple automated methods for choosing the high pass corner frequencies. And I've been working um, along with colleagues at UCLA over the past few years to try to improve those algorithms in GM process and generate um, ground motions that match the NGA ground motions closely. Um, there are many configurable options in GM process. So if you're interested in ground motion processing, I would encourage you to check that out. And just as a note, um, because I think we want to make sure all of our results are starting from the same place, I did make a comparison between the GM process data set and the data set that Tristan talked about earlier today. So this is for the 97.8 earthquake showing PGB on the left and PGA on the right. And as you can see, um, the results are very consistent here. We don't see any systematic differences in the ground motions, and we're pretty happy with that. We also compiled metadata to go with our ground motions. So like I mentioned, GM process calculates a suite of source to site distances, including point source distances and finite fault distances. And those finite, excuse me, those finite fault distances are calculated using uh, finite faults when available. 
and estimated from a magnitude dependent relation between point source distances and finite fault distances from Thompson and Warden when they are not available. And then we also populated our um, VS30 at station locations from the global mosaic of Deep et al. 2020, and that's what's shown on the right. Um, and in Turkey, this is populated with the global uh, slope based proxy of Wald and Allen. So here's what the ensemble data set looks like as a function of distance. So there's peak ground acceleration on the left and peak ground velocity on the right, where the colors represent uh, magnitude bins um, going from largest in yellow to smallest in purple. And so um, you can see that there's quite a wide distance distribution for the largest earthquakes. And then um, the smaller earthquakes kind of dominate the data set in terms of number of records, which makes sense because there's just so many more of them. OK, and like I mentioned earlier, in this talk, we're using uh, ground motion model comparisons to better understand uh, the ground shaking. And here I'm using the NGA West 2 ground motion model of Bore et al. 2014 or BSSA 2014. Um, but because we're really using the ground motion model more as a reference, um, any model would be okay to use. So this really isn't a statement on the relative performance of um, any one model. And uh, Bore et al. 2014 used records from about 400 global earthquakes from active shallow active crustal regions with magnitudes between three and eight and distances out to 400 kilometers. The NGA West 2 database did have 70 records from seven earthquakes in Turkey, um, with the majority of them being from this um, sequence of earthquakes in 1999. And those were in the northwestern part of the country, which is fairly far away from uh, the where the 2023 sequence occurred. Um, so I just want to point that out now, and I will revisit it later. But in general, the magnitude distance distribution of our data set, which is shown here, falls um, within the range of, of data considered in Bore et al. 2014. So magnitude 5 to 7.8, and distances mostly um, with 10 kilometers to about 500. And so um, when we, we can make a more quantitative comparison between the ground motion model and the ground motion data by calculating residuals, where a residual for earthquake I recorded at station J is just the log difference of the ground motion intensity measure for that earthquake and station minus the ground motion model prediction for that location, which depends on a suite of input parameters. We can then further partition that residual using a mixed effects analysis into an overall bias term, C, which represents for the entire ensemble data set, how much higher or lower are the ground motions than the ground motion model, plus an event term for each earthquake. So for that single event, how much higher or lower is the ground motion than the ground motion model? And then the remaining within event residual, which should represent any um, remaining path and site effects that are not modeled by the ground motion model residual. Uh, you can further partition that within event residual into a site to site or delta S to S residual component, which represents the deviation from the ground motion model site response. So any um, component of the site response that was not captured uh, by the median ground motion model and uh, remaining residual epsilon. So um, before starting to look at those partitioned residual components, I find it useful to look at a more direct comparison between the ground motion model observations and the, between the ground motion model and the observations to get a sense um, for what's happening physically. And it makes it much easier to interpret those partition values from the previous slide. So here's an example of that shown in PGA and PGB for the magnitude 7.8 main shock as a function of joiner bulk distance with bind means shown in red. 
and it's compared to the BSSA 14 ground motion model for the average site condition of these records. And you can see right away that the ground motion model is in line with, very much in line with the data at the closest distances for both PGA and PGB. Uh, for PGA, there's consistency between the model and data out to 500 kilometers, but for PGB, we're seeing under prediction of the data at the moderate to large distances. And here's the same comparison for the aftershock, the magnitude 7.5 aftershock. And you can see a very similar trend where the PGA is well matched by the model, but there's um, some under prediction happening for the PGB values. And so um, I also have this comparison for the rest of the ensemble data set binned by magnitude, you know, starting from magnitude six and a half to seven. I don't want to spend too much time going through each of these, but I'd say the main takeaway here is still the same with well-fitting models, kind of at the closest distances, and then some under prediction for PGB at the longer distances. So here's uh, six to six and a half, five and a half to five, or sorry, five and a half to six. And here um, for these smaller earthquakes, we start to see over prediction of the PGA values. And then here are the smallest earthquakes, nine to five to five and a half. And we can see um, some misfit that's being driven by um, a difference, we think in the distance scaling slope. So the data near source are still well modeled. Um, but there's a misfit at these larger distances. So now that we have a general sense of what to expect, at least for those peak ground motions, we can start to look at the various partition components. And the first one is that bias value C, which represents the overall ground motion model bias relative to the entire uh, data set shown in black. So this is for the ensemble data set. And uh, just for reference, I've shown the mean residual for the main two largest earthquakes, the main shock in red and the aftershock in blue. So, sorry. There we go, trying to get my animation to work. Um, so anything above zero or positive here indicates model under prediction and anything negative indicates um, overall over prediction. And so um, you can see, right, we, like what we saw on the previous slides for the largest earthquakes, PGA is generally well modeled, the bias is close to zero, um, although it's over predicted for the ensemble data set driven by that um, distance scaling misfit of the smaller earthquakes. We saw that there's um, fairly significant under prediction of PGB uh, for the two largest earthquakes, and well, as well as under prediction um, at long periods, which I didn't show in those scaling plots that you can see here. And um, for the ensemble data set, this is you know 0.25 log units, which is um, about a factor of 1.3. And um, for the aftershock, it's 0.8 log units, which is a factor of 2.25, which is pretty significant and um, consistent with um, the results from the previous talk. We can also look at the event terms or the average ground motion model misfit per earthquake. And we already know that there's some misfit being driven by the ground motion model distance scaling slope. Um, and we want to avoid mapping that into our event terms. So we assume that the earthquake to earthquake variation in ground motion uh, is mainly represented by the near source ground motions. And we only use records within 50 kilometers to estimate the event terms. And this is following some work that Anne Marie did for earthquakes in California. So when we look at those event terms as a function of magnitude, we do see a trend for PGA on the left at short periods. And that goes away by about one second, um, indicating that there may be a misfit in the magnitude scaling of the ground motion model relative to this sequence. 
And this uh, may also tell us something about the relative energetics or the stress drop of the aftershocks relative to the main shock, um, which is not something, we haven't seen a difference between those um, in the ridge crest sequence, for example, um, but it's possible that's happening here. And I also want to note, um, there doesn't seem to be a systematic bias related to the use of local versus moment magnitude shown in blue and red. So another thing to consider when estimating event terms is the azimuthal sampling of the records. Um, and to, to achieve a centered event term, we need a well-sampled or equally sampled azimuth distribution, as the paths in different azimuths can be affected by multiple processes, such as the earthquake radiation pattern, ruptured activity, and of course, um, spatially varying path and site effects. And so here are the ground motions from the magnitude 7.8 main shock as a function of distance, and they're color-coded by azimuth. And just for reference, um, about 60 degrees in this kind of yellow-green color aligns with the northeastern propagating portion of the rupture, and 220 uh, in this blue, light blue color aligns with the southwestern propagating portion of the rupture. Um, so if you stare at these plots for a long time, it's kind of hard to tell if there's a systematic trend um, as a function of azimuth, but you can see that the azimuths are not sampled equally overall or equally as a function of distance, which we know um, can bias our event terms. And just to show you um, a really significant uh, example, I just want to briefly take you to California and show you this plot from the 2022 magnitude 5.1 Allen Rock earthquake uh, that occurred on the central Calaveras fault. And this is the exact same plot. Um, but here you can see that there's a really significant difference between what we think is the forward directivity direction in green and the backwards directivity direction in pink. There's about an order of magnitude difference. Uh, in the ground motion amplitudes. So this sort of azimuthal sampling can really affect the ground motion amplitudes. Um, and so to handle this, we developed an azimuth weighting scheme to estimate the event terms where we bin the data into azimuth wedges and then weight each bin equally. And so for Alan Rock, this results in up to a 30% difference in the estimated values. And when you use this method um, on the two largest earthquakes in the uh, Turkey sequence, which are shown in red and blue respectively, um, it results in up to a 50% difference in the event term values at about 0.4 to 0.5 seconds. So it's not um, insignificant. Okay, we can also look at the site-to-site -site residuals or the repeatable empirical site response that's not modeled uh, by the BS30 scaling term of BSSA14. So this is what's uh, left over after the BS30 scaling is removed, and red indicates stronger than modeled site response, and blue indicates weaker than modeled site response uh, for PGA and PGB. And we can see some consistencies here. Right. So, for example, there's stronger site response in the Hate region to the south of the rupture, where we know that there's a basin structure, as well as in the Istanbul region to the northwest. Um, and then there's weaker than modeled site response in the kind of central part of the country here. And this is um, consistent across these peak ground motions. And you can also see this spatial trend um, at one second and five second response spectra. But I will say, uh, although I think using an ensemble data set to estimate the site response um, means that the estimates are more robust, um, the majority of the earthquakes we considered are coming from the same general source zone and therefore have the same path, especially as you get further away from the source. That plus that distance scaling misfit that we saw earlier means that accurately separating the site effects from the path effects is um, difficult and may not be uh, complete here. And so the last plots that I want to show are the within event residuals or event corrected residuals for the two largest earthquakes. 
So these residuals have had the overall ground motion model bias and the event term removed. And so these should represent a combination of the path effects, site effects, and any spatially varying source effects like directivity for a single earthquake. And I want to um, show some of the similarities and the differences between the magnitude 7.8 and magnitude 7.5 aftershock. So here's the magnitude 7.8 and 7.5. And I'll flip back and forth a few times. So generally, they both show under prediction or stronger than average ground motions at the farthest distances, kind of at most azimuths. Um, the main shock shows larger than average ground motions at the two ends of the rupture, which could indicate their activity effects. But at this stage, um, it's unclear if path and site effects are commingled with their activity effects, especially in this Hate region, where we also see positive residuals for the aftershock. Um, although this region off the northern end of the main shock shows larger than average ground motions, whereas in the aftershock, it doesn't. So that could be potentially related to uh, directivity. So um, in conclusion, overall, we see that shaking from the largest events in this sequence is within our expectations at the closest distances, but under predicted for PGB and the longest periods, as well as over predicted for smaller aftershocks in the far field. And all of this is as compared to MGOS2 ground motion models. Um, I think more work is necessary to uncouple the regional path and site effects as well as the uh, rupture directivity effects on the ground motion amplitudes. And I think that this sequence will help us develop um, new and novel methods uh, to do this. And lastly, the NGA West 2 approach was to regionalize uh, the analastic attenuation term of the ground motion model, so the slope with distance. And I think we're moving to increasingly complex regionalizations um, that will be informed by this sequence. So we see um, that the distance scaling that was calibrated to earthquakes in Northwest Turkey does not match the scaling from this sequence, especially the smaller earthquakes, um, indicating that finer regionalization than was considered in previous projects um, is likely necessary to accurately model the ground motions. And with that, um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parker. I really appreciate you joining us um, today for this presentation. All right, so I'm going to switch over and we'll start going through the question and answers. Um, I'll start back at the beginning and I will, as best as I can, direct them to the speaker um, that I think they're intended for. So we'll start first with a question. Um, I think this is for Dr. Buckreis, and which is how do flings how do fling estimates from ground motion processing compare to GPS data? Great. So thank you for the question. Unfortunately, the GPS data that we have available to us in the, the region surrounding the fault was made using very coarse, um, or I should say low resolution measurements. So the accuracy of those measurements themselves is the, within the same or even greater than the order of magnitude of the fling that we're extracting from the ground motion. So the to specifically the the GPS will be accurate within three meters, say, and some of the largest flings that we're extracting from the time series are about three meters themselves. So we don't we can't compare the those quantities directly. However, we can compare INSAR data for if the trends that we're seeing, for example, large um, displacements in this area, in, in this direction compared to large displacements in, in this in the other direction in this area. In those comparisons, we see fairly consistent um, agreement between the INSAR trends and the trends that we also see in our data, but we can't uh, compare quant uh, using um, the actual fling step that we extract from the time series quant uh, in a quantitative sense. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Professor Osbalut. 
What type of structural system provides the greatest earthquake resistant design features for near fault effects from large magnitude earthquakes greater than seven? So <laughs> that's a good question, but I think uh, the answer is not very, uh, very easy. Uh, it, it, it basically depends on, you know, the, uh, the, the purpose, the usage of the building. Uh, um, and and also many other factors. Uh, I think uh, the the more uh, one thing that I can mention here is that uh, for near fault, you know, the uh, ground motions that uh, uh, we know that uh, there are higher uh, seismic demands, uh, higher uh, displacement uh, demands uh, in the structures. And uh, if we choose, if we detail or structural system, I think any uh, type of structural system can perform well. But uh, the important thing is is, is to just to, you know design uh, design it uh, you know the more accurately considering those uh, those effects. So uh, the the near uh, pulse like ground motions and the design phase needs to be considered. Okay. Um, the next question is for you as well. Uh, what are the implications of having spectral demands exceeding design levels for a design engineer? So uh, I think that uh, first uh, emphasize or highlight the, the importance of the ductility. Uh, so um, the design, uh, uh, if uh, if the demands are higher than the design level, uh, still uh, the, the structure should have sufficient ductility to prevent the collapse. Uh, so it is. Uh, it may or may not be the you know the above the the, the kind of the uh, maximum considerate uh, earthquake level. So again, uh, that uh, in kind of highlight emphasize the importance of the uh, the ductility and detailing the structural uh, system correctly uh, to prevent uh, catastrophic uh, failures. But it also it may also uh, suggest or um, uh, that. Um, um, some, um, you know, the, the from the functional recovery perspective, if we want uh, those buildings uh, to to perform better uh, in in a in a um, in a event uh, such as uh, higher than the design level event, we may consider um, the more frequent use of the uh, the seismic protection technologies in in these regions uh, in in high uh, seismically uh, active regions, high seismic demand regions. Uh, so that can be another uh, consideration. Okay. Um, I think this next one's for you as well. Would you comment on what contributed to the collapse of shear wall buildings? Yeah, this uh, shear wall, uh, you know, the buildings, they are quite relatively new buildings uh, in, in the, the city of Marash, Karaman Marash. Uh, and and uh, the initial observation, so a group of uh, faculty, uh, Turkish, uh, my Turkish colleagues visited this site uh, and uh, their initial impression, and they have, you know, there's some additional photos and uh, the the observations on, on those buildings. And their uh, initial observations suggest that really uh, the the construction practices were uh, poor. Uh, the, the 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 we observe like a kind of out of plane uh, buckling of the 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 shear walls, suggesting you know the um, you know poor material properties, concrete material properties, uh, and very limited concrete cover, very poor detailing. Uh, so those may have uh, contributed. So that was the, their initial impression. When I analyzed the, the data, the, the ground motion data close uh, 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 close to the state, uh, the, the the site the, from the stations for, uh, to the site, uh, I also observed that the the demands may uh, may be quite high, especially if the the this. Um, uh, these buildings are sitting on a, a soft soil. So without knowing more details uh, about the soil site uh, condition, the building plan, I, I think it's tough to uh, comment uh, or you know the, more on that, but uh, I can definitely say that some poor construction practices were there uh, and potentially some high seismic uh, demands at high periods. Uh, and those buildings, I think there were 15 story buildings, so relatively high, you know, the, the high buildings. So these two might have contributed to the damage. Thank you. Um, 
This is another question for you, Professor Osbaloon. Your findings suggest the revised spectral acceleration, spectral response accelerations in the more recent Turkish um, building earthquake code lead to underestimates of seismic load demand compared to the previous codes. Does that mean using pre-2018 building codes and design of recent newer construction may have led to better outcomes from greater resiliency during the February 2023 earthquakes? So, yeah, I, I understand the point, but I don't want to jump into this conclusion. Uh, to be honest, my analysis were not uh, that in-depth to make uh, such a, you know, the, the conclusion. Uh, but uh, the, my observations for this uh, specific site was that uh, this newer, you know, the seismic uh, the hazard maps are uh, were providing a, a considerably lower, uh, lower spectral uh, accelerations compared to the uh, you know the previous uh, the uh, seismic uh, hazard map. So, uh, but uh, the 2007 uh, and 2018 uh, or you know the, the the specifications have you know diff like quite a number of differences, including the definition of the soil side uh, uh, and and uh, and others. So those should be considered to make uh, uh, more meaningful uh, you know the uh, conclusion. Thank you. Um, my next question, I believe, um, is for Dr. Parker. What is the evidence that a bias term is required? Is not the real bias that site response is most dependent on source properties? Sure. So I think um, what my group is most interested in is trying to understand um, what is driving the bias. So right, I think it's um, it's kind of undeniable that when you compare uh, ground motion records to a model, the model is meant to represent the median case, right? So any individual earthquake will likely deviate from that in some way, um, which is expected. And so trying to understand if that is being driven by variations in stress drop or path effects or side effects is really important and difficult sometimes. Um, and so I think that's when these sorts of ensemble approaches where you can look at um, records from many earthquakes at many locations helps to tease apart those um, different components. And so uh, I think Right at the end of the day, we want to, you know, that overall bias C term, we'd like to explain it in terms of a source process or a side effect or a path effect, and for it to eventually go down to zero. Thank you. Um, this question, I think, might be just a general question that anybody can feel free to participate in, but what is the difference between the U.S. measure of magnitude for the two major earthquakes at 7, 8, and 7, 7, and the Turkish measure of magnitude at 7, 7, and 7, 6? So Grace or Tristan might know better than me. You know, I reported the Turkish ones, but I, I, I'm not sure what is the main, you know, the reason for, for this, you know, the, the magnitude calculation. I'll take a, a crack at answering it. So it's a bit out of out of my ex, uh, expertise also. Um, but when it comes to reporting magnitude, there's many different event catalogs that report magnitude. So the USGS, for example, has a catalog. AFED puts out a catalog. And there's also other regional and global catalogs. And the difference is really what process, the, the inversion steps that they're taking to, to derive that magnitude and the amount of data that they're taking in that process. So for example, the 7.8 the and the 7.7 .7 that I reported were taken from um, the Global Centroid Moment Tensor Catalog, which samples from, uh, as the name suggests, the uh, global earthquakes. So it's expected that it averages over regional effects. If you take the, the Turkish catalog uh, values, uh, this, this would be my uh, suspicion. They've sampled only earthquakes around Turkey, so they, their magnitudes might be slightly biased towards regional source effects. That may or may not be true. I'm, I'm not 
an expert, that's that might just be one justification. It's it's the the data that was used in the inversion process. It boils down to, unless Grace has anything to add. I would agree with that, and just you know say that the reported magnitudes are estimates, right? They're inferred from data. We can't observe moment magnitude directly. And so they depend on the data that's used and the inversion method that's used, which vary you know, from institution to institution. Thank you. Um, Dr. Parker, I have another question yeah. for you. Um, the large amplification at a period range of about one second in Haite, which may be correlated to damage, is more correlated to site or basin effects or is it directivity? I think it's hard to say at this point and probably is a combination of both. So that's my easy way out of the question. Um, but that is something where we have seen kind of repeatable amplification in that region um, over many different earthquakes, right? Not just earthquakes that ruptured into that area, like the main shock. So for the main shock, I think I'm sure there was some combination of directivity and site response. And I think, right, Tristan showed a waveform that had that velocity pulse, which is a signature of directivity. But I think um, it was a combination, oh, you know, over the entire sequence. Okay, and I think we have one more question here. Um, for Professor Osbalut again, what is the effect of thickness of the soft ground? Um, in the February earthquake in Turkey and Syria, how far were the international codes effective and good? Okay, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but uh, for uh, for the soft uh, soil, the, the thickness of the soft soil, uh, I guess that uh, if you have, you know, the, the deeper, like a, a, a higher thickness of the soft soil, that means you have more soft soil there and there, there might be, you know, that, that, that might, uh, you know, the, uh, that means that your seismic waves will uh, travel through those, uh, uh, you know, the uh, soft soil uh, and amplify the, the ground motions more. Uh, so the, the deeper the, the soft soil layer, uh, the, the stronger the application might be. Uh, and for the international code part, uh, uh, I, if, if the question is about like the how uh, the, the Turkish and Syrian design codes uh, were comparable uh, to the international codes, I, I won't be able to comment about the, the Syrian uh, code, uh, but for Turkish uh, design codes, they are... Uh, quite modern uh, seismic design uh, design code, so um, uh, I personally don't don't think that, especially this uh, the latest ed edition of the Turkish, uh, you know, the seismic design code uh, is pretty uh, comparable with the uh, the design codes that uh, that is being used in uh, in the U.S. or other part of the world. Okay, I, if there's any other remaining questions, please submit them in the question and answer uh, dialogue. Um, otherwise, if um, if there's no more questions, we might be able to give everybody a little bit of their time back for today. If anybody has their hands raised and you had wanted to ask, this is your chance to ask a question to one of our speakers. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that this presentation will be available um, on ERI's YouTube account later this month. So the presentations and all the discussion will be available there for viewing as well. Great. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers and to Kristen and the San Diego chapter officers for organizing this event. Um, I want to remind everyone that there are two more webinars in this series. Next week, there'll be one on functional recovery of buildings. Um, and there's one on Friday, October 27th on impacts to social recovery. Those are both, if you registered for this one, you already have access for those. So you don't need to register again. Just make sure to join us at 11 a.m. on those dates. You'll get a reminder email. Uh, I wanted to ask you to take a moment of time, if you can spare it, to complete the post webinar survey. That link should pop up um, after this Zoom session closes for you, but you'll also receive it by email tomorrow. So you can answer then if you have time. You can learn more about ERI at our website. 
And if you want to support the work ERI does um, for learning from earthquakes, which is the, our flagship program that um, runs our earthquake reconnaissance uh, and other research efforts, you can donate to the LFE endowment there that also supports uh, this webinar series and other public events. And then finally, I want to thank um, and acknowledge FEMA and also ERI members uh, for their support that allows us to put on this webinar series. So thanks again to everyone for attending. I hope to see you all next Thursday and then on Friday the 27th for the remainder of the sessions in this colloquium series.